Hi, good morning. My name is Jim Lewis. Welcome to CSIS and our shiny new building. Uh, well, it's not that new anymore, but it still feels new. Um, we have a really good group today. We're going to go over the report that uh, McAfee is releasing that all of us worked on, on the cost of cybercrime. It's a global estimate that follows the report we did about a year ago, uh, looking just at the U.S. and coming up with a model to estimate this. So we'll open with Tom Gann of McAfee here in Washington, who will introduce us and make some opening remarks. Thanks. Well, hello. It's a pleasure to see you all uh, bright and early this Monday morning. And uh, we're very excited about this report. We're very excited about our panelists here. Uh, what I'd like to do today uh, to briefly uh, tee this off is first to talk a little bit about why McAfee has supported this type of research in the past and this kind of research today. And then uh, I've got the great pleasure of introducing a very distinguished panel. So first, why did we support this study? CSIS has consistently come out as the leading think tank in the world on national security matters. Uh, indeed, the University of Pennsylvania every year puts together a very significant research study evaluating the think tanks throughout the world and thinking about which think tanks truly have distinction in particular areas. CSIS consistently ranks as number one. So what we wanted to do was, uh, again, work with the top think tank in the world that has an understanding of national security matters. And it actually goes beyond that. CSIS has got a strong in-house team of economists, a strong network of economists that they work with on a global basis. And for us, this was essential. This study was all about, first and foremost, focusing in on the true cost of cybercrime and using sophisticated econometrics, using sophisticated statistics to derive valid estimates of the genuine cost of cybercrime and the implications for the global economy and policymakers. For us, a study of this kind is all about getting to the truth. It has far less to do with the aggregate numbers. It is all about doing valid academic research to inform the public debate so that policymakers and business people can act with conviction and act based on useful and valid information. Now, in terms of our research team, uh, Jim Lewis uh, is a senior fellow here at CSIS. Uh, many of you here in Washington know him. He has been one of the truly distinguished scholars in the field of cybersecurity and national security for quite some time, having led substantial policy reports uh, informing the president on the future of cybersecurity in their uh, well-received 44th report. Uh, he's held distinguished positions in government, both at the State Department and the Commerce Department, and also holds a PhD. Uh, Paul Rosenzweig uh, has uh, similarly had a distinguished career both in government and also in academia, uh, having served in the administration as a Deputy Assistant Secretary for Cybersecurity Policy, having published numerous impressive works on cybersecurity, and acting today as a professor of law and a lecturer at uh, George Washington University. Now, Stuart Baker uh, is an old friend. Uh, he uh, had been the Assistant Secretary of Cybersecurity in the Bush II administration, had served earlier as the General Counsel of the NSA, and has had a long career at Steptoe Johnson as one of the leading international uh, policy experts and international lawyers with a focus on national security at Steptoe Johnson. And finally, uh, Scott Montgomery, a colleague of mine, is our Vice President uh, and CTO for Public Sector. Uh, he's had a long career in the technology field, uh, having uh, served in policy roles, having served in technology roles, sales roles, and uh, prior to coming to McAfee, having been the uh, lead architect and visionary for Secure Computing, a very impressive uh, firm doing web technology and firewall technology focused on security. 
So without further ado, I'd like to present Stuart Baker, who's going to be here to provide the high-level findings, and then we'll have a good panel discussion, and uh, then we look forward to strong questions and an informed debate from our, uh, you know, uh, wonderful guests. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. Uh, uh, Jim and I will, will try to do this together, uh, but uh, I'll lead it off. I think that means I get to play Gracie Allen to his George Burns. Uh, uh, and um, uh, I'm looking forward to that. Uh, um, so let me just start. I'll, I'll just walk through this uh, slide by slide and let uh, uh, Jim provide uh, color commentary. The key findings uh, from this report uh, are that the global cost of cybercrime is, depending on how you extrapolate it, uh, between $375 and $575 billion annually. Uh, um, we uh, settled uh, because our mid-range uh, 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 extrapolation was $445 billion. We have settled on that as if you need a single number, that's a single number. Uh, but very broadly, the, uh, the range could easily be uh, between 375 and 575. Uh, uh, we also took a, a, a look at the job impact, which was pretty significant uh, in the U.S., uh, 200,000 jobs uh, annually lost as a result of cybercrime, and in Europe, about 150,000. Uh, we didn't try to do a global number, uh, in part because uh, in some of these cases, there are jobs gained in, in black market and uh, um, uh, other uh, fields that uh, uh, we were not going to be in a position to estimate. Uh, and then, uh, probably just as important, as we were doing this analysis, uh, we relied heavily in the end on uh, 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 assembling uh, all of the studies that had been done in national markets on uh, the cost of cybercrime. And I think what we found is a remarkable variability in the number and maybe more importantly the quality of the uh, national estimates that had been uh, uh, prepared. Uh, many governments just don't do a good job of producing data and uh, um, that led us to the conclusion that the uh, uh, overall estimates are probably because of uh, underestimation uh, on the low side. One thing to bear in mind is that the job loss might actually be um, a shift from high-wage jobs to low-wage jobs. So that's part of what we found there. It's not that this is the, a net loss to the economy. It's that people move from high-income jobs to lower-income jobs as a result. Uh, many governments do not produce good data. Many governments don't produce any data. And so that was one of the problems. We found data for about a third of the countries in the world and in <coughs> many places. Some were startling. Uh, Indonesia, Argentina, Korea, big economies didn't, didn't really have any good data. So that was a shock. So um, uh, moving on to the, to the remaining key findings, uh, um, the cost of cybercrime is going to continue to go up. We, uh, barring some miracle of uh, uh, cybersecurity uh, uh, innovation and in investment, uh, uh, there are going to be more businesses online next year than there are this year, that mobile uh, uh, networks have not yet been fully exploited for cybercrime purposes. And the Internet of Things, uh, the mass uh, uh, deployment of sensors uh, uh, across uh, the globe uh, using um, operating systems that are known to have flaws and which are almost impossible to patch in many cases once they, they're deployed, all of those things create new opportunities for uh, uh, cybercrime. So it's hard to believe that there won't be growth in those areas. Uh, uh, and, you know, the companies that are getting all of this stolen data are gradually going to get better at using it, uh, figuring out how to, how to exploit it uh, effectively. Uh, uh, 
And then uh, we, um, we see, uh, and this is an interesting um, uh, insight, uh, we see the, uh, uh, the growth of cyber espionage uh, or uh, cyber theft of intellectual property as um, best seen as a tax on innovation, something that dramatically reduces the return on innovation for people who do research and development. Uh, uh, and it's an eating of the global seed corn in many ways. Uh, I, uh, the companies that invest in R&D are not going to get the benefit and therefore are going to invest less in R&D. The companies that get the benefit of stolen uh, IP will never learn to innovate. Uh, and eventually when, when they run out of other people's IP, they too are going to uh, hit a stall. Uh, and so it's going to be bad for everyone in the long run. Yeah, I think the issue that we came up with, and this is one of the reasons you get a range of uh, estimates from people, is, um, and it's important to note this builds on our first report, and it actually builds on a prior report we did for McAfee on critical infrastructure. What people take and what they get, and I know this is in the report several times, are not the same thing. So you might steal a uh, billion dollars worth of intellectual property, but you're only able to monetize uh, perhaps 10% of that. And we know from the huge data breaches that th hundreds of thousands of people will lose data, but the criminals will only be able to turn a small percentage of that into actual monetary losses. That was interesting in a couple of ways. First, data breaches turn out to be global. I, I didn't realize that. that it, every developed economy has huge data breaches involving tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people. Um, second, um, one of the things that we decided was worth watching is the ability of criminals to monetize uh, what they take. Easy to hack, easy to take information, hard to turn it into money. And so I think what we're looking for is what's the variable when it will be easier to turn stolen information into actual money and get monetary loss from it. So let's uh, let's start down into the methodology we use to estimate the uh, the cost. Uh, um, and here, uh, uh, these these are the numbers I gave you at the top of the uh, discussion: uh, 375 to 575, 445 as a as a rough midpoint. Uh, um, the extrapolation, the the the, the explanation for that uh, swing is that. Uh, uh, we discovered that there was a substantial difference between the percentage of GDP that developed countries were losing to cybercrime and the percentage that uh, developing countries were losing to cybercrime. There's a variety of possible explanations for that, uh, uh, but it is a widespread phenomenon. And so the question of estimating global uh, um, uh, costs uh, where you don't have data from every country, uh, that problem uh, uh, requires that you make a decision about how much of an adjustment you're going to make uh, and uh, where you're going to make it. And the midpoint that we arrived at was essentially saying, let's regionalize the data and let's assume that various regions, which often are uh, characterized by similar or roughly similar levels of uh, uh, development, uh, have roughly similar GDP losses. Uh, and when we extrapolate the numbers that we had uh, regionally, the 445 is the number we arrive at. Uh, uh, and as I said, overestimation is uh, it, certainly possible, but we think underestimation is much more likely. Uh, uh, victims don't report their losses. Maybe they don't even know they've lost uh, something. This is certainly true with intellectual property, uh, um, as we said in the report. Uh, uh, if somebody steals your bicycle, you know it the next morning. If they steal the plans for the bicycle you plan to build in, in a, a year, you may not know that until their, uh, their bicycle comes online at the same time that yours does. So there's a substantial uh, uh, lag in identifying uh, cybercrime and, uh, and its costs. And in many cases, the losses are almost impossible to monetize, such as military advantage. Uh, uh, it's a little hard to put an exact price on some of those losses. Uh, yeah, one of the surprises in this report was that um, for the countries where we were able to uh, interview people, almost all of them reported difficulty in uh, 
uh, having uh, victims admit to their loss. And so the, this is just a rough number, and it's not in the report, but maybe half of the companies that get hacked don't tell the local police, or the local police don't have the time to pursue more than 40, 50 percent of the cases they get. Routinely, we heard from police forces in European countries and Asian countries that they were overwhelmed by the level of cybercrime. They didn't have a good measure on it, but that overwhelming thing is one of the questions we had that said, well, maybe this was an underestimate. If police across the world are telling us they can't keep up, uh, what does that say about cybercrime? So uh, uh, in terms of estimating costs, uh, 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 from a jobs point of view, we came up with the uh, 200,000 and 150,000 uh, jobs uh, uh, figure by looking at uh, export-driven GDP uh, gains and uh, uh, back calculating to the uh, job implications of losing export jobs, which we thought were the kinds of jobs that uh, R&D tends to drive. Uh, uh, and uh, you'll see there the uh, GDP impact that we estimated, particularly in uh, uh, relatively developed countries, uh, uh, about one-half to uh, uh, eight-tenths of a point off of GDP in, in, in any given year. Yeah, the um, part that was interesting was that, uh, not surprisingly, richer countries tend to lose more, right? And we, it could be that, you know, because they have more money, that's where cyber criminals, fo cyber criminals focus their efforts, you know, better return on investment. Um, it could be that they're, they're, they're more involved in intangible goods and products that are easy to steal through hacking. But that was the, the difference here. We were a little surprised at the spread between high-income countries and low-income countries. I think the, the lowest, uh, the, the, the least developed, uh, the losses were on the order of 0.2 percent, right? Yeah, with the caveat that we went through, that's true, but with the, we, we, you'll see in the report we gave them high, medium, and low confidence about how good we felt about the numbers. And um, the probably, hmm, the majority of numbers, maybe a quarter of the numbers, we didn't have really high confidence in, and those tended to be the low-income countries. Not entirely. There were some high-income countries. It was really kind of a surprise. You'd ask the national police officials or the intelligence officials, you know, do you have an estimate of the losses? And they would say no. So that was um, a shock. Well, that, that takes us to the, uh, the point that cybercrime data is highly variable. Uh, and uh, uh, as an example, I think, um, uh, of, the, uh, of a developed country that produced a very low number, the number we got out of uh, Japan was uh, on the order of, what, 0.02 percent of uh, GDP, a billion uh, dollars, uh, which just didn't match up with what China was experiencing the U.S., Germany, uh, Europe as a whole. Uh, uh, none of those numbers were anywhere near as low as that. Uh, in fact, that was probably one fiftieth of many of the losses on a GDP basis, uh, which dramatizes, I think, the need for better, more consistent uh, data. Uh, and, of course, the, we've sort of uh, talked about underreporting uh, uh, already um, and the um, uh, difficulty of getting governments to uh, adopt good uh, numbers. You know, one of the reasons we, we keep harping on this is our sense that uh, if governments were producing an accurate estimate of losses, it would have an impact on government policy as well as the policies of companies that take their cue from government. Uh, uh, and the, uh, uh, the f uh, if governments produce numbers that underestimate the loss, uh, uh, there's a tendency on the part of uh, companies to say, well, it can't be that big a problem. Yeah. Um so I keep referring to the first report we did because it did a lot of the spade work for this report. And in that first report, we dealt with the issue of can you value intellectual property? And so one of the things you hear sometimes is, well, we can't put a value on intellectual property, therefore we can't come up with an estimate for the loss of cybercrime. And in one of the review sessions we had, we had a number of lawyers whose job it is to value intellectual property. And they said, no, this is something we do every day. It's part of a how you value a company. It comes up in mergers and acquisitions. So it is possible to value IP. 
one of the reasons for the range in estimates is depending on the assumptions you take, you come up with different numbers. And so talking to these lawyers, talking to some of the M&A people, not the usual community, um, we tried to pick a middle ground. But it is possible to value IP, and that's discussed at length in the first report. The other thing we did, building on the work in the first report, is we came up with a predictive model. It's really basic, um, and it just basically says, if this country suffered the same level of loss as what every other country like it seems to suffer, what would the number be? And that's actually the high estimate that you saw there, that the predictive model said this is how much they would lose. And in many cases, we found countries that were reporting very low losses when the predictive model said if they were like everyone else in the world, the losses would be much higher. And so either they have a miraculous cyber defense capability, which we found doubtful, or they're underreporting. You know, uh, one of the things that we did to sort of validate uh, our assumptions about this was to look at the losses for other kinds of um, um, activities such as uh, ordinary narcotics trade, uh, uh, software piracy, maritime piracy, uh, things where uh, the global economy functions. Uh, we recognize that these losses are bad things, but we have learned to live with them uh, as something that is more or less under control, and many of those losses, uh, uh, from those things down to uh, uh, shoplifting and pilferage, uh, fall into a range that's in the neighborhood of one half to uh, uh, one and a half percent uh, of uh, the economic activity. So let's uh, let's just talk about how we broke down the cost of cybercrime. This is a little more conceptual. We didn't build up our estimates, but we did look for all of these elements to be included in the national estimates that we relied on. Uh, uh, innovation cannibalism, loss of IP, this is a major category and very difficult to uh, uh, actually I, uh, uh, put a good number on. Uh, although I think when we finally started actually calculating what the impact of cyber theft might be, it looked as though it might be reducing the return on research and investment by as much as 50%. Uh, uh, it's, a, it's a very significant hit. Uh, um, in addition to that, we looked at financial crime, which is easier to measure if you can get people to tell you about it. Uh, that is to say, losses in actual dollars. Uh, uh, confidential business data market manipulation. This is a, a sophisticated form of financial crime, I suppose. Uh, and it, it ranges from uh, targeting your merger and acquisition counterparts to find out what their, uh, their best offer is and to hold them to that offer, uh, uh, to uh, trying to find out who is uh, um, engaged in uh, uh, merger negotiations so you can bet on their stock. Uh, all of that happens, and it's often quite difficult to identify the crime. Uh, uh, in fact, if you identify the, uh, the insider trading, you're likely to be able to uh, punish the actors. If you can't tell it happened, uh, uh, then um, uh, the crime is successful and the uh, cost does not get measured. Uh, uh, opportunity cost, uh, things that you could have done uh, online with the uh, 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 information technology that people are simply afraid to do, uh, reluctant to put uh, information in the cloud, reluctant to use the Internet of Things, uh, reluctant to uh, uh, get the best out of mobile technology precisely because uh, of legitimate fears of exploitation. And then finally, uh, what you could call recovery costs, which is what does it cost you after you've uh, suffered an intrusion? Uh, what do you spend on your incident response, on uh, upgrading all of your security, uh, on uh, providing a variety of uh, credit monitoring to the victims of the cybercrime, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So those are the elements uh, that we looked at uh, uh, as, as legitimate uh, cybercrime costs. Yeah, and we were helped in doing this with some uh, good work that other people had done. Ross Anderson at Cambridge did a review of... Uh, cybercrime costs in the UK, he looked at a smaller category of losses than we did. So his, his numbers were different. 
but we threw more things in, including recovery cost, opportunity cost. Poneman Institute has done a good survey of recovery costs around the world. That was kind of interesting because what we could find and what the Poneman survey said is that the recovery costs are highest in the US. And we couldn't explain that, but maybe because maybe there are just so many lawyers here, I don't know. <laughs> but uh, recovery costs, so you found a range of recovery costs that was different. Um, one of the things we tried to measure, it looked like from our first study and our second study, is that the loss uh, from the theft of intellectual property is increasing. There's usually a lag, so you steal the plans, it takes you a few years to build the things. It used to appear to take somewhere between seven and ten years to exploit stolen IP on average. Now it appears to be less, maybe six to eight years to exploit the stolen IP. So that means that was one of the reasons we said this is a conservative number, costs will grow in the future. Finally, on opportunity costs, and we have really good data as one of the appendices on spending on cybersecurity and what people are spending on. And so a good way to think about opportunity cost is these are resources that people could have used for something else. Not just the fear of doing things on the net, but you're spending hundreds of millions as a nation or even billions of dollars on defense because of this heightened risk that you could otherwise spend on more productive activities. So that was, um, that was one of the better parts of the research, I think, is that the recovery costs had a, one of the differences between our first report and this report is re, we assigned a higher share to recovery costs and opportunity costs than we did in the first report. And then uh, uh, let's uh, uh, close out the, uh, the presentation with the future of cybercrime, which not surprisingly, uh, we uh, assessed it as a growth business with more and more people coming online, especially in uh, developing countries uh, uh, with new infrastructures to exploit. Uh, uh, our assumption is that uh, even if losses stabilize in developed countries, uh, uh, they will continue to grow in developing countries as their online populations grow, uh, uh, and more likely, losses are going to are not going to stabilize in developed countries. They're going to continue to grow. So we we see a lot of opportunity if uh, you're looking for a uh, uh, a future uh, business line. Uh, cybercrime certainly looks as though it's going to continue to pay off, uh, uh, and we're going to have continued losses. Yeah, that about sums it up. Yeah. <laughs> so with that, Tom, do you want to take over? No. Thank you. Probably helps to turn on the microphone, right? Uh, so ni nice job on the report, nice job on the analysis. I uh, want to take a few minutes to talk a bit about the implications uh, of the report from our point of view. You know, reading through the report and the depth and the complexity of it, I think some really important implications come out. The first thing is the degree to which this is a extremely dynamic challenge. You know, one of the really interesting questions is at what point does a tipping point truly occur where cybercrime transforms itself from something that is an acceptable loss, something that is really the cost of doing business on a day-to-day -day basis, to something that is transformative to a uh, challenge that uh, tips to the point where uh, the world changes and the response changes. Uh, that's a, an interesting theme that I think we'll talk more about in our panel. In terms of our big takeaways uh, where we sit at McAfee, uh, the first one is on the need for enhanced investment in public-private partnerships. Uh, it's clear that there's a challenge in terms of getting good data. Uh, one way to address that data challenge is to enhance the partnership between the private sector and governments worldwide to report on cyber uh, crimes, cyber attacks when they uh, occur, to work together to truly analyze how those attacks uh, were propagated and what can be done about them. Following on that, uh, to enhance public-private partnerships is the need to improve real-time information sharing, uh, leveraging technology and other capabilities to enhance the kind of information sharing that can occur in real time. Cyber attacks can occur in seconds, can occur in minutes. 
though it may take months or even years for uh, an attacked organization to understand that they were attacked. So doing innovations on information sharing, leveraging best practices and technology, we believe can make a difference to uh, improving reporting, improving responses. Thirdly and finally, uh, I think a clear implication is that organizations both in the private sector and the public sector need to look at best practices on how they secure themselves. Uh, what we tend to find, and I think what the research tends to show, is that organizations that think about security in a holistic way, uh, developing a high-level strategy, putting in place the people, processes, and technologies necessary to defend themselves end-to-end, -end, uh, generally protect themselves the best. And organizations, on the contrary, that uh, don't put cybersecurity at a sufficiently high level in the organization, don't invest in the right people, processes, and strategies are the ones that tend to suffer the greatest losses. Now, uh, I think so often with these reports, much of the value comes in a deeper discussion uh, from a distinguished panel, which is something that we'll do right now. And um, I've got the uh, great privilege of, of uh, asking some questions. You know, firstly, um, uh, I'd like to ask Jim Lewis, uh, a lot has been made about the question of the aggregate numbers uh, and the question of the job losses. You know, can you have shed some additional light on the methodology used to derive those estimates? Uh, sure, and Stuart, jump in uh, when you get a chance. Uh, we started out by uh, looking for uh, open source data on uh, losses at a national level, and we found uh, data for, I think it was 58 countries, uh, of mixed quality, but we said, what, what do people say they're actually losing? And in most cases, we found uh, a couple estimates, uh, a high estimate and a low estimate, or in some cases, a ridiculously low estimate and a ridiculously high estimate. Um, we just took that as a start. We then looked for uh, confirming data to see how likely is it that the number we got at a national level was accurate? And that was a surprise in that the number of incidents on a global basis is, um, just if you totaled up the anecdotes we found, you would be in the billions of dollars. Uh, we then came up with the data we found and with the work in the first report to develop a predictive model so we could say, here's the number we found, here's the number that would be predicted by the model, how close are they? Um, and what was the fourth step? I think we then... We talked to oh, a bunch of experts. We interviewed, uh, we interviewed actually uh, officials in about, uh, I think it was 18 countries, and said to them, um, what do you think the losses are? What's your estimate? How do you do this? And got a range of answers. So we got a, a lot of help from uh, foreign partners, mainly in, in Europe and in Asia. Uh, and using all those things and putting them together, we came up with the number. Can I ask a question? Oh, absolutely. No, no, no about, about the methodology, just because it's interesting, and this is... Tom, can you hit your button? Yeah. yeah. Um, and this is actually, we, I asked you this outside. Um, you know, last year, a uh, congressionally chartered commission, the Commission on the Theft of, a, of American Intellectual Property, put the annual IP-only losses, so just one of your six categories, it's something like $300 billion in America. And, if, and obviously, if that's the case, then 455 globally for everything is too low. So I was, I was wondering uh, what distinguishes the way you estimated it from that, and how do you account for the difference? Because kind of natural question. OK, I guess I'm stuck. Um, no, no, oh, Stuart, this one's for you. <laughs> So some of it is uh, building off our first report, which we were fairly comfortable with the uh, theory that um, losses in the U.S. were about 100 billion. We are, again, a range because this is a model. So we said U.S. losses are somewhere between 90 billion, 120 billion. And again, we picked a middle figure as the most likely. Uh, I think that the context of if you look at other huge global transnational crimes, <coughs> other transnational crimes, 300 billion would be uh, excessive. 
Um, the, the real difference, I think, is both the assumptions going in and the difference between what is taken and what is actually monetized. So you've had a number of people, including General Alexanders and others, say this is the greatest transfer of wealth in human history. Um, and if you're counting the value of what's taken, that's a, a true statement. So a company might spend a billion dollars on R&D. If you count the actual losses, though, it tends to be smaller because a billion dollars of R&D taken by someone doesn't translate into a billion dollars of gain. They have to be able to monetize it. And so I think that's the main difference is the, the and uh, this was actually Stewart's line, um, you know, if you lose a $500 bicycle, the thief may only resell it for 50 bucks on the black market. That same thing happens for cybercrime. Right, and, and somebody can steal all of your IP, you spent uh, $50 million developing that IP, you could legitimately say it's worth $50 million. But if the guy who stole it never brings to market a product that actually hurts you, then you haven't lost anything like the $50 million. You know, one of the really interesting issues in, a, in a, uh, the study of economics, for sure, is the question of tipping points. You know. Uh, how do things change and what are the implications for that? I mean, it's clear from this study that uh, the ability to make use of stolen intellectual property today seems rather limited, but will that be true in the future as uh, countries and organizations become better technically, become uh, more capable from a manufacturing point of view? You know, uh, Jim or, or uh, Stuart, uh, What's yeah, your point they're, they're, we, we think that they are going to get better at, at doing this. Uh, um, it's not surprising. They've got a flood of data now, and they're just sort of, uh, in many cases, just picking through it, trying to figure out how to, how to deal with it. But uh, as with any uh, IT innovation, people learn how to use it uh, more effectively over time. And so, uh, you know, there are just questions. If you steal a whole bunch of IT, uh, IP from somebody, how do you get it to, the, to, to people who can use it? And are those folks set up to do it? And as they begin to see value in it, the people who get it are going to start having specialized teams whose job is just to research uh, in information in the language uh, of the uh, uh, victim company. Uh, and you'll learn tools like, uh, do you create a little database, uh, uh, a sort of mini WikiLeaks, uh, uh, and make it searchable? How do you make it searchable? Who does the searching? All of those are things that, that, that cyber thieves have to learn in the context of stealing IP. And they are going to learn it, and they're going to get better at it. Tom, there's also no uh, disincentive. Uh, as we saw after Operation Aurora in 2010, the largest uh, intellectual property theft in history, exabytes and exabytes of data being exfiltrated from some of the largest companies in the world, both high tech, uh, uh, heavy industry, et cetera. Uh, only two of those companies, Google and Adobe, uh, admitted that the theft had occurred at all, although 50 had uh, literally, literally exabytes of data exfiltrated from them. So there's, there's the, on the front end, there's the, um, we're not going to admit that we had a problem from these companies, as the report notes. And then on the back end, there's the disincentive, uh, there's a lack of disincentive with respect to literally millions of lines of code uh, in, in many of the ex examples being available to these cyber criminals without there being any uh, repercussion for using them. You know, Scott, uh, you've worked with many organizations around the world on protecting themselves. Uh, given the implications of the report, what are best practices that you see that organizations are engaging in to protect themselves? I thought a lot about this um, after reading this report. And one of the things that struck me is, in the first half of the 20th century, is, is am I the only guy hearing that echo? Is it bad? Is it really bad? Go? Okay. In the first half of the 20th century, you would take your cash to the bank and you could point to it. It's in that vault right over there. $100. Well, there's no notionality of location. And I think this is something that 21st century companies have failed to recognize. Uh, well, where is this asset? It's behind our firewall. Well, that's a ludicrous notion. If you've enabled the, uh, the asset to be seen from the internet, there is no behind and there is no network. 
It's simply an asset that's available on the network. So what I'd like to see companies doing uh, and what we advocate at Intel is to be more data centric. There is an absolute value to each piece of data within the organization. And to date, only the adversaries and cyber criminals have done a good job of creating uh, the valuation for that because they pick their targets very carefully, don't they? So uh, I'd like to see us become a little bit more data centric and I'd like to see us um, look to, uh, the attackers need to find one way in. And in the case of a noteworthy retail breach, it, was the, it wasn't the point of sale register, it was the HVAC system, which enabled, enabled them to go in and move laterally. Does that mean you should spend millions of dollars on HVAC protection? No. What it means is we need to properly identify the risks and make expenditures uh, uh, according to those risks. And we're doing a poorer job of that than the adversaries are. Paul, you'd had the uh, great privilege of working in government, thinking about how organizations should protect themselves. Uh, what are sort of uh, stories of successes or stories of challenges that, that you saw in your tenure in government? I want to hear the successes. Yeah, well, <laughs> the, 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 the biggest success was working for Stewart, so there you go. Uh, 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 government is a difficult uh, participant in this debate. It is insufficiently nimble uh, and overly hierarchical in, in a domain that is extremely distributed and dynamic. Um, I think that government's best successes come when it sticks to the things that it does best, uh, serve as a conduit for information sharing, uh, perhaps as a purveyor of information that it, it is uniquely in the possession of through classified means and methods. It does that poorly, but it does have some competitive advantage in that it is capable of um, acting in, in ways that some private sector actors are not presently permitted to, at least not in the United States. Um, of course, overseas, some of those uh, barriers seem to disappear. Where it, um, where it, I think, gets into difficulty and some of the failures that modes that I would say is when it, when it tries to see itself as uh, the decider uh, the regulator, the setter of standards. It, it does that poorly and slowly. Uh, yeah, I'm a, I'm a big fan of the NIST cybersecurity framework. I think the people who were set with that test did a great job, but I think that it sets a kind of bare minimum standard that doesn't really address a lot of the advanced threats that we see today. So in the context of what you've been talking about here um, uh, and what the report says, I think that one of the really uh, important roles that we might consider for government is to increase and enhance its ability to collect and disseminate accurate data about cybercrime. Um, you know, even, even reports like this are, are at best based on estimates, surveys, uh, and, and, and the like. And what we know from, from traditional kinetic crime is that uh, you address what you measure and that we invest more resources in things that we start to measure better, whether it's a uh, uh, murders in Washington, D.C., or sexual assaults on, on campuses or whatever. And uh, to date, we have done very, very little uh, as a government in uh, either incentivizing or, dare I say, even requiring uh, reporting of, uh, of uh, breaches that have uh, adverse effects. It is, I mean, it is the case that most, of the, most companies won't admit it, they are not obliged to, and, and there's plenty of, uh, of incentives for them not to do. Beyond that, um, I would think that government's best role uh, would be to kind of get out of the way of the private sector in terms of actual activity in, in, in developing new tools to combat cybercrime, because I don't think that they are uh, quite nimble enough to do that on a really consistent basis. Does that kind of answer your question? Tom, I'd like yes. to, to pull that thread a little bit and echo that. Um, th we spent a good portion of the 2000s uh, in government in particular, but also the private sector, working on compliance reports, whether it was FISMA or whether it was HIPAA or whether it was PCI uh, for the credit card companies. But there's no correlation between that re printed report 
and an information security posture. The organization's security posture has very little to do with that printed report moments after it's printed. And I think uh, one of the things that's going on, particularly in government, where government is actually taking a, a lead position, is at Homeland Security and its continuous diagnostics and mitigation program, where they're saying the, mo the fact that you measured a month ago is not relevant to your security posture now. You need to be aware and basing your decisions risk by risk as they occur, not when you decide to measure. And I think that's one area where government's actually setting a, a bar that's, that, that, that's a good bar to set. The other thing I think that's interesting is the government, and in this case, uh, the state of California with its SB 1386 bill, did a fairly good job of saying, we're going to force people who want to do business in California to report these particular things as it relates to the privacy of consumers who are breached. But there is no corresponding litigation or bills uh, even in progress today where companies are forced to disclose this, and in particular, pu public companies. Uh, and this is something where I think government could say, well, wait a minute, what's good for the goose is good for the gander. So I, if I could just jump in on the government role. I, I spent two hours recently at a dinner with some of the smartest people in this area talking about the government role. We covered a lot of the topics that, that you all have covered here. And at the end, I said, you know, I feel as though I was sitting in a meeting of the chief of police and his aides talking about some massive new wave of street crime. And the question was, well, could we share information about the crimes that are being reported to other people to tell them what kind of body armor they should buy when they go out on the street? Or maybe we should actually ticket them if they don't have the right kind of body armor and, 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 and they haven't got up-to-date body armor. And I said, Jesus, you know, the role of government is to find the criminals and make them pay. Uh, and, and we have not done enough of that for a variety of diplomatic and other reasons. This is one, one of the reasons I welcome the indictments that the government has, uh, has brought, because it shows that that spirit of finding the bad guys and, and, and making them pay isn't dead, and the government hasn't given up on uh, some creativity in finding ways to, uh, uh, to bring the pain. I, I, you know, I think uh, 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 Paul used to suggest that this had something to do with my Scots-Irish heritage. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, I, I don't think the government spends enough time on that question. How do we find people, and then how do we persuade them that they should choose a different line of work. Well, the other thing that is uh, apparent is that we've got some very uh, distinguished uh, members of the audience, uh, you know, and uh, we've got about 10, 15 minutes to go. I'd like to reserve time now to uh, receive questions from the audience. Uh, young lady in white. Hi, I'm Dr. Donna Wells. I'm an expert in the Russian language internet. Uh, can you talk a little bit more about the confidential business data market manipulation variable? How often does this happen and how did you come up with the figures? Thank you. This is um, one of the places where we've had a few countries say they were beginning to uh, investigate this. And we had one country say, one of the problems, it was fun for me because it was like being a reporter in that people wouldn't say very much on the record and if you were willing to go off the record, they would say a lot more. So uh, we had one country say they had uh, some evidence that this had occurred, right? It wasn't one of the ones you'd expect. The way people are trying to measure it is by using the data they use now for inside, the, pardon me, the, the search techniques they have for insider trading. So there's programs that look for patterns that would suggest insider trading. Um, you could do the same thing to find this kind of stock market manipulation. But it is very difficult. We put it in there because it's, again, one of the categories that we thought might lead to an underestimate. Um, people have not found a lot of data. There are these few anecdotes of people manipulating stock prices. But it's uh, the area where if you were going to do this again, which we don't want to, um, uh, you would hopefully be able to find better data. 
Yeah, but the other half of that, manipulation of the information yeah. to find out what your counterpart is right. prepared to settle for uh, is now viewed as routine. Uh, and uh, um, uh, investment banks that work on these things expect that they're going to be targeted uh, and their lawyers are going to be targeted and their clients are going to be targeted, uh, all in a very well-developed effort to help uh, often state-owned enterprises get the best deal possible. Yeah, really good data on uh, the effect on M&A, uh, not so good data on stock market manipulation, but uh, a number of countries raised it as an area of concern. Uh, the lady in, uh, in green. Hi, Amber Corrin. I'm with um, Federal Times. I was wondering if you can speak specifically to any cost to the federal government. Um, were any of those figures broken down in your report or uh, maybe in your expert opinions and views? Maybe you can tell us a little bit about any U.S. government specific costs and outlook. No, we didn't do that. We tried to do it for the complete economy. And in some cases, we thought about uh, looking at the military uh, effect on military cost. And right, so you could imagine a process where you'd say the U.S. spent X on this fighter aircraft. They lost the IP for that fighter aircraft. They had to spend uh, some num amount of money to repair the damage from that loss. There was also a much more difficult to measure cost in the sense of a foreign opponent now had better capabilities. And that was the part where we decided you just couldn't really come up with a good number. So I think uh, didn't try to look at the whole economy because measuring military advantage is, is so difficult. We, we put that one aside. Uh, I would say, though, that in that particular example that James is mentioning, it, it does speak very well to the trend uh, that the CSIS guys found where there was an acceleration of the ability to utilize stolen IP from the eight to 10 year window into a much sooner window in that particular example, for sure. For what it's worth, I'd say that there are three ways to kind of think about this that are useful. One is the one that, that Jim alluded to, the Defense Science Board I issued a report in 2013, it was classified, which means that it appeared in the Washington Post only a couple of weeks later. Um, that listed, uh, I think the total number was 82 different technologies and, and weapon systems that had been compromised in one way or another. Uh, so that's a significant loss. It's difficult to put a number on it. The second way to think about it is uh, how much the U.S. government is spending on its own internal cybersecurity which has gone through the roof. It's, I think, on the order of $50 billion this year. Um, so that's, that's just, call that opportunity cost or recovery cost. $38 billion for DOD, and then there's the DHS and the other. And then the, and then the third way to think about it is simply that if you, if you go out and look, you can find, um, I, last I looked, there was something on the order of 80 data breaches of U.S. government systems in the last uh, five years or four years. You know, and and in the uh, in the private industry, we monetize those at, at between one and three dollars per record loss. So uh, a, a a nice rough estimate of, of that kind of cost would be would be three three dollars times the number of records summed over eighty breaches in five years. I, I haven't done the figures, but yeah, it's 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 a lot of money, uh, but it's not. I mean, it's not existential money either. Uh, Larry. Thank you, and first of all, thanks to uh, McAfee and CSIS for doing this. This sounds like a great report. I can't wait to, to read it. I want to return to the point that Stuart was making a minute ago, and I'm from Irish heritage, so maybe that's why we agree so much. Um, some of the estimates I've seen indicate that law enforcement maybe gets one or two percent of cyber criminals, and one of the things that frustrates people on my board, they're talking about all the time, is the amount of money uh, Corporations spend on old security, hiring guards to stand in bank vaults, you know, when no, only an idiot would now walk in with a gun, you know, try to steal $500 out of the till when you can go in a, a room and steal hundreds of millions uh, through cybercrime. I'm wondering, have you guys done any comparison 
with respect to the amount of money we are losing with respect to cybercrime and the amount of money that law enforcement is spending to get at that much larger amount of crime. My suspicion is that the, uh, the, the, the ratios aren't what they ought to be. And I don't know if you guys have done any analysis on this or if you can locate one, but I think that's a, an interesting public policy question. That was one of the things that we thought was a good conclusion out of the report, is that people uh, underestimate risk and therefore they don't uh, spend enough on this. And so from, um, as I, I said, I think in the opening, police forces around the world told us they simply couldn't keep up. Uh, one of the G20 economies told us that they were overwhelmed by the amount of cybercrime. Another one told us they could only uh, look at maybe 10% of the crimes that they knew about. And that just happened repeatedly. So, you know, you, you would say this is an opportunity cost. We'd rather be spending the money on something else than policing. But it looks like this is a place where countries could uh, do more to um, improve the ability to catch criminals, right? So that, that was one of the reasons we were concerned this might be an underestimate. One of the reasons we thought it's useful for people to do a better job of measuring risk. You know, if you were a police department and you didn't track um, how many muggings there were, you, you wouldn't be doing as good a job in stopping them. And that's kind of where we are on cybercrime. Yeah, and uh, I guess uh, one thing that we didn't follow through on that uh, actually would be entirely appropriate in that regard is uh, uh, our estimate is that the global loss from cybercrime is roughly equivalent to the global cost of narcotics trade. Uh, there is no cybersecurity enforcement agency out there breaking down doors and uh, uh, intercepting communications uh, uh, around the world to catch cyber criminals. But I, I, I have not asked the question, what is the global narcotics enforcement budget uh, and compared it to the global cybersecurity or at least uh, uh, cyber criminal uh, enforcement budget? But I, I would guess it's 100 to 1 uh, uh, out of whack. And, uh, this kind of report eventually is going to lead people to say, well, why are we spending all our money over here when we're losing as much over here? Well, so we're pretty close to the top of the hour. How about, say, two, two more questions, and then, then we'll call it a day. Um, this gentleman here in the blue. Good morning. I'm uh, Tom Risen from U.S. News and World Report. I got a question about um, companies have been talking a lot about their information sharing and their efforts to combat these breaches, but do you think companies employ enough cybersecurity specialists with technical skills like coding to combat hackers? Um, they their colleges turn on a lot of specialists on cybersecurity, but some of them study more policy and law than they do coding and programming, and that's what hackers do. Um, do you think there's enough of that training out there? Training, yes. Trained professionals, absolutely not. So there are absolutely the, the right number of venues uh, and training programs available for a, co a good cadre. W what there aren't, there's not enough butter to go over the bread is, w is what it boils down to. There, there simply aren't enough people who know what they're doing to, uh, available to either government or the, the private sector. And they're also, uh, it's very, very difficult. Uh, we, across both uh, public and private sector, we seem far more enamored with buying tools uh, and going after the new shiny pebble far more than training our workforce in order to combat uh, the adversary with the tools that we have. I would posit that most organizations would find themselves a lot better off uh, if they simply <laughs> utilized the, what they have today well. Um, but I would say that there hasn't been a time in the recent past where there's been more visibility more awareness, more communication. I, I would say that because practitioners have found themselves on the wrong side of bad math, that they're doing a much better job, particularly FSISAC, in sharing uh, information with one another because a win in the community benefits everybody. So if I, if I could just add to that, you know, I, uh, uh, I think some of, as I think about the cybersecurity people I've been most impressed with inside companies, uh, one of them started her career as a nurse, 
one as a cop, another as a lawyer. Um, and what's, what was unique about them was their ability to continue to learn and to think about the problem anew. Uh, and I remember a, a guy I was uh, uh, talking to who was an undergrad at Brown who said to me and sort of summed it up, uh, he said, you know, in this field, uh, you're either self-taught or you aren't any good. I, and uh, the, the, I, I wouldn't focus so much on their background as on whether there are enough people who are willing to stay self-taught for their entire careers. Hey, Tom, we have the room for a little bit more if you want to try and squeeze in a couple more questions. Sure, absolutely. Uh, the fellow uh, in the front. I think it's on. Oh, okay. Yeah, Eric Fisher with the Congressional Research Service. I was wondering um, to what extent did your uh, estimates of GDP include the underground economy, or could they at all? And if and whether or not that's the case, were there any which, if any, countries actually had a positive impact on GDP, uh, or might have if you could have included the underground economy? No, we use the. Um IMF and World Bank uh, GDP figures, and so just took them to get a level point. It's clear that a few countries, but a very small number of countries, get a net benefit from this. But it's, it's smaller than you might think, because uh, it turns out everyone, including our favorite suspects, are, are losing money as a result of this. So that was, again, one of the things we found, global problem, everybody's losing. Some places the net loss is smaller, but we looked, we just, for consistency's <coughs> sake, stuck with uh, mainly IMF figures. Uh, yes, the uh, uh, young lady in the front. Yes, it works. Claire Devan, Nisos Group. Um, yeah, I was wondering, uh, exact same question as you were uh, mentioning. Um, so the one or two percent cr cyber criminals that we are able to catch, basically, are they most, mostly s state actors or, uh, I don't know, private sector? And yeah, that was my question. Thanks. That's I'd love to answer that if you don't want to, but... <laughs> no, I'll answer it. No, I'll answer it, and then we can all chime in, because that's a good one. <laughs> um, we don't catch most cyber criminals, and we don't catch the most successful ones, and so that's the heart of the problem. And the ones we do catch, I think it's kind of Darwinian. They tend to operate in countries that uh, observe the rule of law or where it's not in their national interest to hack, and so they are largely uh, private actors, right? But we're not catching the top of the league um, that's one of the p reasons, again, we thought this was a growth industry is so far there is impunity uh, for the best cyber criminals. I would say uh, it depends on who you ask and when you ask them. Uh, certainly there's no difference in the net result of these companies. There's absolutely no difference in the net result. It's only in the motivation of the individual. Uh, so I would posit that uh, the results that these guys found are, are pretty staggering. Um, and I think that regardless of the motivation, uh, this is something that, that uh, is it's absolutely addressable from a pure risk management standpoint, whether your risk is from a, a flag or a guy looking for a bag of money. Yeah, I do think, though, that, that the motivation matters because that goes to Stewart's deterrence point. Um, people who are profit-motivated uh, criminals uh, are much more readily deterred by what we would consider to be traditional criminal sanctions. And, and the answer to that if, that, if you think that's the nature of the problem, is better cooperation, uh, better information sharing across the globe, uh, you know, make the Council of Europe uh, global, get people to go. The problem is, is that a lot of the, a lot of the criminality is if not state-sponsored, then state-motivated, state-tolerated, state-permitted. State state and then you have to actually start thinking of this not in terms of, uh, of the narrow cybercrime, but rather a large-scale diplomatic uh, uh, initiative that involves uh, economic, financial, diplomatic, law enforcement, intelligence, 
uh, tools of, of a wide variety of, of uh, things. And so, uh, I mean, to put it bluntly, I can say this probably because I, I'm the guest here, but you're not going to deter Chinese uh, intellectual property theft simply through uh, an indictment of five guys. It has to actually uh, happen at a higher level if the U.S. government has to undertake a large-scale policy decision that it wants to deter it, uh, and then undertake more significant actions to, to, uh, to do that at the government-to-government -government level. Uh, Paul, I think that was, uh, so I totally agree. It, it's chicken and egg. If your house is wide open, and you put, uh, you put uh, something in the larder, and someone comes along and takes it, without any form of disincentive, regardless of whether they're a criminal or sent by the next town over, your larder is going to be raided again. So the, my point is, from, from the economic impact standpoint, we have to observe this purely as a risk management issue until the many years go by before there's any form of hardened policy or, or you know, and, and I, you, you said 100 to 1 with respect to criminal, uh, traditional criminal uh, narcotics spending versus cyber. I think, you're, I think that's, it's probably worse than that, right? So my point is not to say that uh, the, the motivation isn't important, but until, you, until the community has gotten its arms around risk management, you got bigger fish to fry. Uh, yes, the uh, lady in the third row. Hello, Pamela Passman from the Center for Responsible Enterprise and Trade, create.org. Thank you to McAfee for investing in this kind of research. Um, and I look forward to reading the report. But I wanted to go back to some of the issues around intellectual property theft. I think we all appreciate cybercrime is just one way that uh, IP theft occurs. Um, but you've, you've talked about uh, your different cost factors, and if you can just uh, enlighten us a little bit more on what percentage of your cost do you think is related to IP theft. And your number related to IP theft, you talked about it being the value that the criminal receives from the IP theft, which seems to me to, to undervalue it quite a bit. If there's a billion dollar of R&D investment, wouldn't you be looking at what that owner of the IP could have valued from that $1 billion investment. Thank you. We, we talked about this, about this issue a lot in the first report, uh, where we tried to establish some of the uh, basic uh, methodologies uh, for this. And I, what more would, do, would you want to, what was the first part of the question? I couldn't, I'm sorry, I forgot now. Oh, yeah. Percentage. And what we found, it was interesting, is that it, uh, it varies from country to country, and some of that is it depends how IP intensive the economy is, it depends how developed the economy is. So you can have a country, it doesn't, that wasn't, normally we could use wealth, income to predict losses. In IP theft, it didn't work so well, so you could have a high income country um, from mineral extraction right, that did not lose as much as a high-income country that was IP intensive. So what we found is a pretty broad global variation driven by um, the role of IP intensive industries in the economy. And that's one reason why de less developed economies uh, lose considerably less than more developed economies. And the, the one thing I would add to that is, yes, you st uh, the, uh, if somebody steals a billion dollars worth of IP from you, um, you've lost the billion dollars IP, sort of, but uh, you still have it. You can still develop products based on that IP, and the question is, did it give you as much of a competitive advantage as you expected? Uh, if the cyber criminals are unable to commercialize the um, products that compete with yours, you may have gotten much of the benefit from that uh, research and development as you expected, uh, even though they stole everything. Uh, so it, it's, a, it's a hard uh, estimate to arrive at, but we just didn't feel that you could just say, this is how much I spent on IP and they stole it all, so that's the value of it. Uh, the fellow in the very back. Thank you. Uh, I'm Sun Jin from Chinese Embassy, but I will speak totally as an international professional. 
I would like to say that the report is very interesting. However, I have two questions. First, it's concerning the definition or the scope of the cybercrime you mentioned. It seems that uh, this report is only concerning the so-called cyber theft. However, the cybercrime is an international used term, which covers a large of issues. Maybe some issues are more important than the so-called cyber theft. So I want your clarification. The second question is concerning about the famous examples mentioned by Baker, Ms. Baker. You say that uh, the steal of bicycle is a crime, I agree. The steal of design of the bicycle is a crime, I also agree. However, it seems to be some different understandings on whether the following categories will be crime or not. First, the steal of design of bicycle for a company may be Lefka. The second, the steal of design of bicycle design for some national intelligence agencies. The third is the steal of design of the bicycle design by a government to benefit the whole industry of that country. So in the last three categories, I wonder your point and ideas about whether they are crimes or not. Because according to international conventions and most legal professionals, the crime is defined on the actions, not by the purpose. Thank you very much. I'll do the first bit. Um, so in the course of doing this research, uh, one of the things we came across was there is no agreed international definition of what includes cybercrime. And that's one of the reasons you get differences in national estimates. Some people count, uh, only count crimes that would occur if the internet wasn't there. Other people count crimes that would have occurred you know, in the real welfare fraud, but all, now are taking place on the internet. So one of the recommendations in the report is you know, we need to have, as we do for drugs or for any other sort of crime, uh, we need to have a better definition. And I note that um, uh, the former head of the WTO pointed out that we have not adjusted our trade statistics to take into account the shift from physical to intangible, that intangible trade is now more valuable, and we need to rethink how we count trade. And in the same way, we need to rethink how we count cybercrime. So, a common definition would be good. That sounds like a job for the OECD or the UN or one of these multinational bodies. And then a better definition that takes into account intangible value. Some of the issues, and this leads into your second question, some of the things we didn't count is because there is no good way to measure the intangible loss, right? And we could have come up with a model that would have been what we would call uh, a bold model, and we just didn't feel comfortable doing that. So I, I, and I don't, <clears throat> I would say the, the way we tried to think about cybercrime losses is from the point of view of the victim. That is to say, uh, one, did somebody break in and steal your stuff? I, and uh, it doesn't really matter who broke in and stole your stuff, uh, you've still suffered the, the break in. Uh, where it does matter and where the adjustment might come into uh, uh, play is that if someone broke into your uh, uh, company to steal information so that they could write a report to a government about the direction of uh, technological uh, uh, thinking in a particular field, uh, uh, and that's all that happens, that some bureaucrat someplace is smarter, uh, you're not going to feel substantial losses from that. Uh, and this is why uh, the theft of uh, uh, intellectual property is so hard to, to value. Uh, we tried to, or at least I would say, uh, th because this is more theoretical than uh, operational in the report, we did draw a distinction between uh, thefts that have an impact on a company uh, in terms of its ability to uh, win and maintain markets uh, using its intellectual property and theft uh, of uh, intellectual property that simply um, has a generally um, educational impact on some government somewhere. Can I just add one point, which is I, I'm unfamiliar with, with Chinese criminal law, so I can't speak to it, but in, in uh, uh, common law countries, motivation uh, and intent are absolutely uh, a critical distinguisher. That's why we recognize things like self-defense 
as a defense. It's why we have different grades of criminality based upon whether it's an intentional offense or a negligent offense. Um, and that's also why we accept uh, justifications in mitigation of, of some criminal activity. So uh, I mean, I can't really speak to it in, in China, uh, having only been there a couple of times, but at, at least in, in the United States uh, and, and the, the other common law countries, we definitely grade and reflect on criminality based upon the ultimate purpose and, 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 and expectation of what the use case was going to be. Doesn't determine all of the punishment, but it's clearly a relevant factor in assessing uh, what the crime is and its significance. All right. Well, I think that we're uh, at about a quarter past. Uh, let's do one final question and call it a day. Uh, yes, uh, the, the fellow uh, right there. Uh, so, j just a quick question. You talk about the report report is there a report and if so where do we get it uh, I think it's um, online uh, now and so we'll I thought we were going to hand out something uh, it is online and we will uh, send you the, give me your card if you want to get sent the link if not uh, check the CSIS website um, I thought I went up at 830 but uh, I'll double check Okay, give the, give the web address then. Stand by. Yeah. Just Google it. <laughs> It'll take a while. Well, very fine. I think uh, this was a, uh, an informed uh, discussion, and I'd like to thank our panel for the fine work that you've done. Uh, and uh, likewise, a thank you to the audience. I think we had a really good uh, range of questions. And so without further ado, uh, let's close this session and uh, get on with the day. <laughs>